I'm Doug Jessup. And I'm Nisha Nagaring, and welcome to Family Heritage Stories, where we talk about what makes us. Things like traditions, values, and culture. How are these things passed down from generation to generation? Through deeds, through words, and through stories. Everyone has unique skills and interests. For example, I am not a painter, but how did you get into your occupation? I've had a chance to meet and chat with a number of guys from New York, but I've never got one on camera. Oh, okay. So I'm glad you're willing. Um, I think everyone of our generation will remember where they were when 9-11 happened. Yes. Where were you? Okay, when the first plane struck, I was home. I was actually at my desk on my computer and my oldest daughter, she was, she was going to, uh, bu, 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 yeah, she, she, she was going to work or college or whichever it was at the time. She comes down and she says to me, Daddy, you know, the planes just struck the, uh, the tower, the World Trade Center. I immediately turned the television on, immediately turned the radio on. Now, the city of New York's got 10, 10 wins. 10 times wins is all news all the time. You give us 22 minutes, we give you the world. <laughs> yeah, I heard that one. Okay, so now they had a total recall of firefighters. They said all New York City firefighters uh, report to there, and they set up different staging areas throughout the city for you to, re to report to. So I just happened to be the, the park that was closest to me was one of the staging areas. Grabbed my gear, got in my car, went down there, uh, and he said, Cap, you got your gear? I said, yep, it's okay. Here's five guys, get on the bus. Okay, got on the bus, and off we went. Uh, now, I remember we went Long Island Expressway, got on the BQE, we're heading into Manhattan. You can see the, the, the second tower had been hit and was coming down, had come down at the, at the, in the meantime. Uh, you can see the two columns of smoke with a, one huge column of smoke coming up. Uh, we, get to, we were going to go over to Brooklyn Bridge. We get to the Brooklyn Bridge, and there's such an outflux of people come out of Manhattan, we can't get over with the bus. Okay, so we turn around, go back on the BQE, head a little, uh, I guess it was east we, we headed, to the Williamsburg Bridge. Went over the Williamsburg Bridge, uh, came into Manhattan, but now, now you're north of the site when at that point in time, which was, in, in hindsight, a God's bus, because... Uh, the wind that was out of the north that day. It was a crystal clear day. It was a gorgeous day. Beautiful fall day in New York City. We came in and uh, we set up a staging area. We were, they said, report to the staging area. You report, report into the command post. We were at the Stuyvesant High School. It's one of the specialty schools in the city of New York. And basically, uh, we waited, okay? Uh, seven World Trade Center was a 43-story building. We had OEM in that building, Office of Emergency Management. We had a couple of thousand gallons of diesel fuel stored in that building to operate all the generators because this is where everybody, every agency met in an emergency to handle the emergency, okay? Uh, I was fortunate I had worked there a couple of times at, 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 when I was in headquarters. And, uh, you know, it, it, it was the idea of OEM is that you need, uh, you got a street collapse. So, okay, I can get up, I can go over to Con Ed's desk and I can say, uh, I need 12 steel plates to cover this hole in the street. Can you get them for me? You got it, you know? That was, it was, it was one on one. Uh, <laughs> the location, the, I don't know what the, I don't know who owned this building that they decided to put OEM in it, but it was next to the number one target in the world. So we waited until about five o'clock that evening watching that building burn before it collapsed. And right around that time, the F-15s were coming up the, up, up the, uh, the river, up the Hudson River. I mean, at my, my neck, the hairs on my neck still stand up when I think of the, when everybody's, yeah, yeah, you know. But we really couldn't start to examine the site and start digging for people until now, now you had all sorts of apparatus coming in. I mean, everybody, volunteers from all around the world were coming. I mean, we were getting units from Jersey and, and you know, there's mutual aid is, is one of the things with fire departments. Uh, 
so my, my the, the deputy that I, I I had the scene, he said to me, okay, I, I must have been there until maybe about 10 o'clock at night. He said, okay, Cap, take up, you know, come back, you know. So I went back to my firehouse, uh, got up the next morning, got another five guys, got them in my car. <laughs> we had all our equipment, went back down. So now you, you, they were they were antsy. They wanted to dig. They wanted to write, you know, like, we're going we're gonna to find, we're going to find. You know, finding nothing here. You know, you're finding pieces. You're finding crushed helmets. You're finding, you know, uh, I says, wait, we got to do this right. I got them proper breathing equipment. We, 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 I ended up, they gave me nine building inspectors and our job was to examine surrounding properties. All this rubble that came down from a hundred and some odd story building. I mean, all you saw was pulverized papers floating and and this this gray matter in the air you didn't see desks you didn't see file cabinets you didn't see anything that you would associate with an office building everything was pulverized uh, these were pancake collapses by the way it's there's three different kind of collapses pancake is is the the if, if you're in the business this is the best you could get because they come straight down they just you know they're not lean twos they're not taking out 14 right. blocks in that direction they, you know so from from that point of view it was uh but we, our job was to uh, force entry into the surrounding buildings to get the buildings department people in there so they could check the roofs. We were, we were very concerned about all the rubble on top of these buildings that if we had a rainy fall, the weight load would have caused secondary collapses. You know, uh, We did that and that was the whole day uh, and uh, it, it, was, it was strange because they, they had by this point in time, they had dogs on the pile. They were sniffing. They were, you know, but but there was no really nobody nobody said, "Hey, I found the body." You know, it it, it was uh, very serene, very very like you know. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the the if you remember the one fireman that was with George Bush, he just passed away. You know? oh. Yeah, he, he's uh, we, we lost three hundred forty three firemen that day, and and most of the. Funerals that I went to, those boxes contained only parts of the body. You know, they they, they did DNA. One of one of the one of my one of my probies that I raised as a lieutenant was into the fire marshals, and the marshals had to they they sent them to the morgue. <laughs> I remember them telling me, they they we worked on these bones all day. They ended up to be a rack of lamb from you know, the trade center. <laughs> that was there's a restaurant up there. Yeah. They would you know. And and for months after that, they were. If you took a black light and you shined it, you got matter on all of those buildings. You know, it, it was just everything was pulverized. How many of those firefighters that lost their lives? If you had to guess, how many do you think you knew or had time? Oh, knew well, maybe ten. Worked with throughout my career. 30, 40. It's a lot. You know, that's, we had, we had, uh, firefighters, we had about 8,000 in, in the New York City Fire Department. You know, and that was, uh, like I said, we lost 343 that day. But now, last September 11th, 2023, we hit 343 extra de death, you know, related to the trade center, not at the trade center. All the cancers, all the most of the cancers and, and things like that that they died from. Nós voltaremos em breve. This is Messy Mob. His room is a mess. His clothes are a mess. The only time he doesn't make a mess is when he makes his chocolate milk. He uses good old-fashioned Hershey syrup in the brand new squeeze bottle. Rich, delicious chocolate flavor that only Hershey can deliver without making a mess. Delicious. Uh, Marvin? Good old Hershey syrup in a no-mess bottle. This is a cubic foot. There are five more of these inside the new Chevrolet than there are inside this year's older style full-size cars of Chevy's nearest sales competitor. That's based on U.S. government estimates of vehicle interior size as reported in the 1977 EPA Guide for New Car Buyers. The new Chevrolet with five more cubic feet of room. It stacks up beautifully. 
Now that's more like it. Ladies, you can't squeeze the Charmin. But this isn't Charmin, Mr. Whipple. This is new Charmin. Even more squeezably soft. But you can see, feel, and hear the difference. See the bigger puffs of softness? But uh, you can feel the difference. Feel how much softer. You can even hear. Enough. It's really... No matter how irresistibly soft, please don't squeeze the new Charmin. Mr. Whipple. Introducing new Charmin. So much softer you can see, feel, and hear the difference. New soft fragrance, too. There is something so special about the bond between grandchild and grandparent. So how would you answer the question? Tell me about your grandma or your grandpa. Uh, from my mom, from my grandmother, from my father's side, she lived nearby. So we, sh we live in the same, in the same plot. There were three different families, but all the same families, like sister, brother, and my, grand, my grandmother lived it with my aunt, which happens to be also my godmother. And she died a few years after I was a kid. She smoked a lot and she had emphysema. So where did you grow up? I grew up in Rio, in a neighborhood in the suburb called Guadalupe. And where was your grandmother from? My grandmother, both my grandmother are from Rio de Janeiro countryside. Okay. Yeah. Um, Cities that probably could, you kind of couldn't point out on maps. Okay, <laughs> it's so, so tiny. Do you have any children? I have, I have, well, children. I have two, two kids, uh, two children. Mm -hmm. My oldest is called Raquel. She's 36, mm -hmm. and she's the mother of my only granddaughter, Sophia. She okay. is going to be 15 next November. Okay, now, that's who I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. okay. Sophia. Sophia. Okay, I love being a grandfather. Yeah, okay. me too. Okay, so, we're going to put Sophia in a time machine. Okay. Okay. She's okay. Now, 10, 20, 30 years from now. Oh, my gosh. Okay, I... so now Sophia is 45 years old. Okay. And we ask, Sophia, tell me about Grandma. <laughs> She would probably would say that grandma did a lot of things for her because she always used her charm to ask for something that she wants. Uh, grandma taught her how to speak English and she is a very good student so she turned out to be probably a great engineer or a scientist because she's a little brainiac. Why did the chicken cross the playground? To get to the other slide. Yes, this is how it's going down, so hang on for the ride. What has more lives than a cat? At least that's what they say. A bullfrog, because it's a fact. They croak each and every day. Think of a riddle your gramps would tell about a kid out on a boat and the punchline he would sell, whatever floats your goat. All from the book, Whatever Floats Your Goat, The Granddaddy of Dad Jokes for Kids and Old Goats. The last words that my grandfather said were, please remember me. This is Doug Jessup. It would be my honor to help you share your story with a private in-studio interview with a video for you to keep. Go to FamilyHeritageStories.com for pricing and to schedule your interview. There was something special about walking to Grandma's house. The smell of those baked cookies, the commercials that were on TV with her, you know, the ones I'm talking about. That's what memories are made of. Uh, to the uh, Christmas time and uh, Easter time, right, we have to eat uh, cold fish. Cold fish, right? This doesn't matter what happened, we have to do this, right? We love so much. Why? What's the idea? <laughs> because uh, over here, the cold fish, it's expensive, very expensive, right? In Portugal, right? And you have to eat this two times a year to remember, right? All the, the tasting, right? With the potatoes and everything, right? And for uh, this special uh, uh, family reunited, you know, reunited family and she's made my mom made this nice cold fish with potatoes, white rice. It's beautiful and nice and so great. Tastes wonderful. Uh, você está assistindo 
à história dos nossos antepassados. Voltamos já já. I have a pretty cool family. Some family I haven't even met, but they are amazing too. How do I know? Your history is everywhere if you know where to look. But searching through all this, are you kidding me? Actually, Kindex makes it easy to gather records and add them to your online archive. So everyone can jump in and index their records, making every word searchable. As I sit here all alone, I wonder what you were doing now, period. So I, I look on that. And there are lots of ways to transcribe and tag records. With Kindex, I know them anyway. One of my favorite inspirational quotes is from Audrey Hepburn. She said, to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. What kind of values are you passing down to the next generation? Blue F-16s, uh, T-38s, worked with the Air Force One for a little while, and you said, you know, funny last name, that is true. So for the first few months, it was S plus 12. That was easier <laughs> than Schallenberger. <laughs> so that, that little plane, the F-14, okay, okay, yeah. Now, you mentioned the, the Air Force One thing. You got it, you can't leave me hanging. Tell, tell me a little bit more. Yeah, so that was awesome. I mean, incredible experience. You can apply to be an advanced agent for Air Force One, and I did that my last year and a half in the, in the Air Force. And, Really, it's where you go with Air Force One anywhere in the world that it goes. You go mm -hmm. out in advance, a week to two weeks in advance, and prep everything for Air Force One. So work with the crew. You want to make sure the president gets in and out. And the idea is to have no news stories. You know, no, no stairs in incidents, nothing oh, like that. Oh, come on. You're, gonna, you're gonna keeping <laughs> us out of business. Jeez, you know. But this was cool. You know, we went to Seoul, South Korea, Mexico, G20 summits. Mm -hmm. You just really see some amazing things. So another just cool experience yeah. and opportunity. Yeah, well, aim high, right? Well, yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. You actually were a pilot right after 9-11. How did that change the, for lack of a better term, the mission of the military and specifically for the pilots? Yeah, it changed a lot. I remember just like a lot of people do that exact day. I was in pilot training at the time in Oklahoma and we were night flying so, you know, we're not getting back till one in the morning and just we're in that phase of training. I remember waking up at about 7.30 or 8 in the morning because uh, we'd gotten home late the night prior. And my wife came in the room and woke me up and said, Rob, you need to see this. I walked out, flipped on the TV right as Tower One was collapsing. Oh, jeez. And phew, I got on the phone. I called over. Bases are getting locked down. I mean, I just got crazy stories from different friends who were in the F-16 at the time who were like, they were just told, get in the air. Uh, in fact, uh, a friend of mine was in one of the two F-16s that was tracking down the flight that ended up going down in Pennsylvania. They were about 80 miles behind it, running it down. And they were literally on the radio discussing, you know, what happens if we catch it? We don't have any missiles. They just threw us right in the jet. We took off. And, and their plan literally was to, if they had to, ram the jet. Wow. Ram the airline. So they were going to try and hit the, the back or the wing, eject if they could, but possibly, you know, give up their life. So. To answer your question, it really changed the game. Uh, obviously, the tenor and tone of war changed. Before, you know, you talk about fighting governments. Well, now you're talking about fighting a, a decentralized group of people, Al-Qaeda. They don't have a home base. They don't have a country. Uh, changed the whole dynamic. So our responsibility, I went to South Carolina after that, was called Noble Eagle. And for three years, we started flying air patrols over our own country. Wow. That had never happened before. So, you know, you fly over New York, there's jets over the Super Bowl. Anytime the president would leave the White House, there's two F-16s or two F-15s or, or whatever with the president. So, it, you know, Bush at the time, when he'd go to visit his ranch in Texas, people don't know this, but there'd be two fighters over the top of him 24 hours a day. We had never done that before in the United States. So it really did change the face of everything. And of course, you know, now we're 
years later, after that's happened, and warfare as we know it has, has changed. What are your family stories? I'm Nisha Degaring. I'm Doug Jessup. It would be our honor to help you share your stories with an in-studio interview. We take out the bloopers, add in your pictures, and give you a digital video to keep. To schedule your interview, go to FamilyHeritageStories.com. Objects with stories, those are treasures remembered. We have some objects here from primary children's 100 years of history, that's pretty cool. So who are some of the, the people that have supported primary children's over the years? The hospital was owned by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and in 1975 was uh, formed Intermountain Healthcare, and the Pennies Parade was started long before that, and then we had Pennies by the Inch, which invited children to give one penny for every inch they were tall to Primary Children's Hospital. So children giving to children. And some of the early people who really helped with that, names that you know are Marie and Donnie Osmond, Robert Redford, well known here in Utah, but also nationally. You know, we had banks so that kids could put their money in. I had a friend who said to me, I can remember as a child doing my pennies and then going to Primary Children's Hospital and giving it to the hospital, which I thought was really unique. In all my years in fundraising, I have never heard of a campaign like that. So that is something very unique to Utah. Oh, and the kids got to put their pennies into a bank that looked like the hospital. So it was pretty exactly. cool. You know, it's exactly. like, yeah! <laughs> it's like, hey, I got to give my money. It's like, okay. Well, and think about it. I mean, you know, that, that gift of being able to give mm -hmm. because in my opinion, now granted I get a little sappy on this one, but the reality is that Primary Children's Hospital gives the gift of life. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can't, it's hard to put a price on that. That's right. And you know, we help save and change children's lives. I grew up where my parents didn't have a lot of money to give, but they were very involved in our schools, in our church, in the community. And as kids, we were all part of that. And I can remember that feeling of, this feels good. You didn't quite know what it was, but it felt good to be part of something outside of yourself. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you, Doug. I appreciate being here. From connecting with cave art to creating videos that show up on your kids' or grandkids' devices, this is all about connection, connecting with people we know and we love. Want to know about the power of a story? We asked Mara. It's priceless. It's priceless to me because I, when I was first sitting with the guys listening to their stories, it's something you just can't get back. And there's a lot of stories I wish I would have had recorded from my dad, my mom, my grandparents. So at least we were able to get these stories recorded and to have them uh, videoed and digitized is key because the younger generation, you know, sitting with my nephews, doing homework with them uh, over COVID, they weren't looking at books, they were looking at screens, and they can look at this on a screen. I'm Doug Jessup. And I'm Nisha Degaring. It would be our honor to help tell your family heritage story. Go to our website to schedule an in-studio interview on the Jessup's Journal TV set. Broadcast audio, video, and lighting are already set up to ensure quality control. All you need to do is come to our Salt Lake City studio and we'll do the rest. Our professional editing staff will take out bloopers and add your pictures to create a private digital video for your devices. Go to FamilyHeritageStories.com for pricing and to schedule your interview. There's something special about traveling. You learn about traditions, values, and cultures. You remember Grandma's slideshow? Oh yeah, that's what we're talking about. Um cantinho violão Esse amor uma canção Pra fazer feliz a quem se ama 
calma pra pensar E ter tempo pra sonhar Da janela vence o corcovado E o Redentor, que lindo Quero a vida sempre assim Com você perto de mim até O apagar da velha chama E eu que era triste Descrente desse mundo Ao encontrar você Eu conheci O que é felicidade, meu amor What makes you smile? Spry mouthwash helps me smile. I think it might help you too. able to help people remember where they came from. If stories aren't passed down from generation to generation, the stories are lost, and it's as though those people never existed. So how do you want to be remembered? With another episode of Family Heritage Stories, I'm Nisha Degaring. And I'm Doug Jessup. Mm -hmm.